I realised that things were wrong, but not to the point that I knew that it was life-threatening. I felt that my life was in danger at that point. If it had not been for the team around him, he would have drowned. He would have either drowned on the bottom, breathing that tank until there was no gas left in it, or he would have died on the ascent because he didn't make it to the surface on the gas he was carrying. Slowly he was poisoning himself. Uh, if it had gone on much, much longer, as we saw later on, he would lapse into unconsciousness and eventually would have drowned. The longer he stays on the rebreather, the more trouble he's in. What you're about to see is rare footage taken during an actual diving emergency. It was captured in real time by a remote operated vehicle or ROV that was being used by the police. Now the incident happened in a flooded quarry and very nearly resulted in the death of a Sky News underwater cameraman from carbon dioxide poisoning. Kevin Capon was diving on a closed circuit rebreather unit similar to this one. Following incorrect instruction received during training, Kevin used a widely practiced but fatally flawed technique for preparing the rebreather. It nearly cost him his life. Together with the police, the Sky News dive team and I featured an ROV that can locate bodies of murder victims dumped in water. The device gathers vital evidence prior to police divers approaching the scene. Amongst other onboard detection devices, the ROV is equipped with a video camera. After about an hour into the filming, it became apparent to me and the safety diver that something was bothering Kevin. We noticed that he was unusually agitated and was struggling to control his camera. He even collided with the ROV. I realised that things were wrong, but not to the point that I knew that it was life-threatening. Having held on to the boat, um, I obviously realised that my breathing rate was now going through the roof and, um, and I was feeling particularly uncomfortable and in, and in all honesty that was the point where I probably felt that I don't want to be in this situation anymore and the first thought, my initial first thought was I need to get out of here. If we look at Kevin, he swims over to the boat and he hangs on trying to get a grip of the situation um, and he's obviously concerned and agitated. He then bails out and he goes on to open circuit. You notice that his ventilation rate is extremely high. Uh, we would estimate somewhere between 150 and 200 liters a minute initially, 46 breaths a minute. And that's really, really going some. And while all of this is going on, there seems to be no urgency with the rest of the dive team. And they're looking to Kevin, who is the most experienced diver for guidance. And in reality, he's compromised at that boat. His blood level has got a high CO2 level. He's probably having difficulty uh, thinking about what he's doing. And although he does respond to signals, he responds to the signals slowly. Kevin is completely unaware of what is happening. A buildup of carbon dioxide in the breathing loop is slowly killing him. To understand exactly what went wrong, let's first look at how a rebreather should operate when working properly. When the diver exhales, the gas contains decreased levels of oxygen and increased levels of carbon dioxide. It passes along a tube to the base of a canister containing granules of calcium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide that scrubs the CO2 from the breathing loop. Once the CO2 has been removed, the air is then analysed by oxygen sensors and the metabolised O2 replaced. The reoxygenated gas is then breathed by the diver. Back at the flooded quarry and Kevin is in trouble because the chemical scrubber has failed to remove the carbon dioxide from the breathing loop. In this instance, we, we did a lot of investigation after the incident and found that um, the divers had been incorrectly taught uh, how to fill the scrubber. They were tipping out the material, uh, breaking it up, breaking up the lumps and then tipping it all back in. Uh, and what that does, that uh, mixes up the, the, the material. So instead of having uh, a layer of used material in the uh, scrubber and then 
behind that a layer of unused material, what you end up with is it all mixed up and so the CO2 can just track straight through. The fresh supply of chemical is um, capable of removing the carbon dioxide from the exhaled gas. In this case, however, what the diver had done was instead of filling the rebreather with a new supply of chemical, he had reused the supply from a previous dive and therefore it no longer had the capability of removing carbon dioxide from his exhaled gas and just allowed it to pass through and back into his breathing mixture. The trouble was Kevin and the rest of us on Sky News dive team were taught this practice on the rebreather course. A subsequent investigation by the health and safety executive revealed that the practice of mixing up reused scrubber material with good material was commonplace. I was absolutely amazed to find out how many divers, when I started to make inquiries, repacked a partially used canister. When a canister is used, it's either emptied or left intact, but it should never be repacked. Part of it goes from old military myths where you could take your material out and dry it on a poncho and then put it back together and do another dive. The reality is that's not the case, especially with the new scrubber materials that are in use today. Once the bed is disturbed, it should be disposed of and fresh material put in. People clearly don't understand the significance of how the canister works and the implications of disturbing the bed uh, before a dive. Throughout the entire incident, Kevin strongly believed that he was still in control of all of his faculties. To fully demonstrate exactly what was happening to him, we'll use several graphic indicators. They represent the level of CO2 in his blood, the level of consciousness, and the quantity of breathing gas remaining in his three-litre bailout cylinder. I always felt that I was in control of the situation after having bailed on, out onto open circuit. I realised that we needed to get to the surface and I do believe and I still believe now that we did it in a controlled manner and that I was able to control the ascent accordingly but as you say um, the experts have, who have looked at it would say otherwise. Gradually he perceives through the clouds of his mind that what he has to do is get off the rebreather and on to open circuit, normal scuba which he's carrying for the emergency. However, the carbon dioxide is still in his bloodstream and still clouding his thought processes. So he stays there and stays there and his team around him don't understand what's going on and they are watching him. What's happening now is that he's breathing very quickly. He's using up a very limited supply of gas and he's going to use it up very quickly as he ascends in the end you see that he runs out of gas. As the CO2 enters Kevin's blood supply his level of consciousness keeps falling as does the supply of emergency gas. CO2 poisoning forces divers into a bizarre cycle of pointless repetitious action. It's called automaton behavior. Kevin may look as though he's in control but actually he has already become detached from reality. No matter how hard he breathes on compressed air at depth, he is not going to reduce the CO2 blood in his bloodstream to a level where he's back to normal in a very short period of time. A high level of CO2 is causing him to breathe rapidly throughout the dive. He's getting through his gas very, very quickly. The dive team at the moment are standing off and watching him conduct a slow ascent, which is admirable for decompression purposes. But sooner or later, if you watch the video, it's inevitable because of his breathing rate, he's going to run out of gas, which inevitably you see him, it happens. At this point, we now have a semi-unconscious diver underwater with nothing to breathe. The safety diver offers his own emergency gas supply, but for some reason, Kevin feels he doesn't receive any air from it. Another possible indication of his falling level of consciousness. As he desperately grapples for air, fear is starting to take hold. I was breathing incredibly fast now and, and it felt that the majority of air wasn't actually getting into my lungs anyway. Um, at that point um, there was probably a little bit of panic. Having been to the safety diver and taken his regulator and not what I felt got anything from it, I then went to your um, spare um, auto air which then I took air from and thankfully I got air from it but there was a probably and what looks like on the video 
a mild degree of panic of me grappling around trying to get some air from someone. But remembering, I am still underwater, I'm breathing at an incredibly, incredibly fast rate, and air is pretty important to me at that particular time. At this stage, the team are close to the surface, but then suddenly Kevin's level of consciousness falls dramatically. Watch his white fins on the right of the screen. At this point, you can see that his legs have all but stopped moving. If he hadn't have been almost at the surface, it is highly probable that he would not have survived. He could have died on that dive, and it could have been his last. If it had not been for the team around him, he would have drowned. He would have either drowned on the bottom, breathing that tank until there was no gas left in it, or he would have died on the ascent because he didn't make it to the surface on the gas he was carrying. On the surface, but without any gas left in his three-litre bailout cylinder, there is no way of inflating Kevin's buoyancy compensation device. Fortunately, though, a police diver grabs him, and he is able to pull him out of the water alive. If we look at the incident itself, some of the failures that were involved in it, the manufacturers produce very, very good guidelines that come with all rebreathers. Uh, and one of the first key issues is failure to follow the manufacturer's guidelines. Uh, the second one that obviously contributed to this was the repacking of the rebreather canister, a partially reused canister. That means the reaction front had changed. So it was inevitable that the diver was going to become compromised with CO2 poisoning. It was just a matter of time. The third thing was really failure of the dive team to recognize the seriousness of the situation once the incident began to occur. It took them a long time to, to actually get a handle on that, and that could have had a disastrous outcome if they hadn't realized towards the end. The fourth thing they really need to think about, which all divers need to think about, is the suitability of their gas for bailout. This was a particularly long dive. It was a mission that involved filming, which was going to keep the divers in the water for a long period of time. could potentially have created a fairly large substantial decompression obligation, and yet the dive was being done with a three litre pony as a bailout gas, was that suitable? Was the bailout gas for that dive appropriate? And people really need to think about that. Um, there was a huge lack of rebreather diving experience and I know that the team after this incident have spent considerable hours on the rebreather and we'd all now admit at the time the incident occurred they had relatively, um, they had very very little experience on diving rebreather technology and had assumed that their scuba experience would carry on forward. It is a very, very different type of technology and requires a different set of skills, and I think they've now learned that as well. You're playing with fire. You're playing with the breathing mixture that keeps you alive. And the CO2 absorbent, absorbing the expired CO2 from your breath is a key element of the rebreather. It's a very, very simple thing to do. It's, it's simply absorbed by the, the softener line, the, 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 the mixture of, of calcium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide. Another area that people have problems with is they, they believe that you have to uh, pack the scrubber. And the problem there is that people overpack. Now, what we're dealing with is a very, very simple filter that the gas has got to pass through in order to remove the CO2. So what we want to do is just fill the scrubber up to a certain level. It's self-packing, it's got springs on the, on the, on the, on the plate, on the pressure plate. Um, so it's self-packing, all you have to do is literally just fill it to the right level and put the lid on. Kevin has fully recovered from the incident and is now back at work with the dive team. He would say that he always put safety first, but now he has even more respect for the closed circuit rebreather on which his life depends.